Hey folks, welcome to the Adventure Sports Podcast. I'm your host, Mason. Today's episode is really, really good with Peter Conti here. We're, we're going to talk about overcoming chronic pain. And a lot of times when we talk about, you know, difficulties on this show and obstacles, it's things that have, you know, you faced, but now they're behind you. But what about when those things are always with you? It can really limit your scope or your, your imagination what you feel like you can do I've definitely been there I've had some knee trouble and just you know you get this idea that you know you can't do as much as you used to could or whatnot but Peter comes along and just blows that out of the water uh, he's in pain all the time and he's like you know what I'm just gonna go through hike the Appalachian Trail like just a crazy idea and had to make some modifications to make it happen, but he did it, and he made it happen, and that is something that he uh, achieved, and holy cow, the stories from this experience are, one, hilarious, and two, just, I mean, they're endless, so I'm excited to read more into the book. The name of his book, by the way, is Only When I Step On It. The book has a ton of amazing reviews, and we're going to be giving away a copy today. All you got to do is email me or send us a message at Adventure Sports Podcast uh, on Instagram or Facebook or email at info at adventuresportspodcast.com. All you got to email me is Peter's trail name. So everybody on the Appalachian Trail that does you know a through hike typically gets a trail name. So if you listen to this episode and you hear the trail name, email that, message it over to us. And uh, if you're the first one to do that, you get a copy of the book. So, And also, I recently did a, a really big, uh, well, big for me, adventure. And it was just a single day, but it was a really cool thing. No one's ever done it. And I'm going to do a little debrief of that uh, that uh, whole thing here soon. I'm just going to do a little monologue record. And it'll be, it'll be weird for me to kind of like sit down and talk about it like that without someone asking me questions about it. But I'm going to give it a shot. And I uh, would love to share it with y'all and just try to try to share more about um, the how-to behind uh, adventures and just some of the ideas that you can do for yourself. And, and, and by the way, fair warning, before we jump in, um, we do talk a decent amount in this episode about uh, just suicide as, as a concept and, and, and how low Peter was at, in his depression at times. And we don't harp on it or, or, or kind of dwell on it too long, but it, it is mentioned and we bring it up a couple times. So if that's triggering at all, just fair warning. But I promise we don't dwell on it and go into too much depth. Um, so just before we jump in. All right, let's go ahead and dive in. All right, folks, welcome to the Adventure Sports Podcast. Today we have a very inspiring story, something that I'm sure is on a lot of your bucket lists, Appalachian Trail, and doing it and all the things, all the human elements and just the the, the inspiration you could imagine and an amazing book to go along with it. We're going to welcome uh, Peter Conti. Welcome to the show. Hey, uh, thanks for having me, Mason. Great to be with all of you here listening in. But where did you grow up? Where was where was home for you growing up? Uh, I consider Colorado home. I spent 26 years out there. So, I mean, loved the mountains and skiing and motorcycle riding and flew sailplanes for 10 years out of Boulder and just, you know, lo loved it. I, I never, ever thought I would be living in Florida simply because it's so flat here, right? When you live around the mountains and you go, you know, hiking and mountain biking and all of that, it just is such a part of life. But but here I am, and I actually love it. The weather here is so nice. <laughs> uh, the weather in Colorado is amazing as far as, like, the mildness of winter, but it's just so sunny and beautiful. But it is really nice. Right now is a beautiful day. Well, wh where in Colorado did you live? I didn't even ask that. Uh, just in the hills west of west of Denver, a neighborhood called Genesee. Oh, yeah. Very familiar. Yep. We were in Golden, so not okay. too I mean, – a little, little closer to Denver itself, but, you know, that was – had to go right through there to get up to the mountains. I spent a lot of time out there. That's an interesting yep. kind of roundabout way. Do you, do you miss it? Well, I've got a daughter who lives out there. Uh, two got two of my seven grandkids that are out there. So I try and get out there every couple of months and always try and get up in the mountains if I can, at least for a hike or you know something while I'm out there. Oh man, that's so, awesome. That I awesome. guess someone taught me one time that the the secret, I don't know if it's the secret to happiness in life, but certainly the secret to moving is you need, when you go to a new area, 
you really need to look for what's great about that area. If you, like when I originally moved away from Colorado, I, I moved to Annapolis, Maryland, and I, you know, I was really missing the mountains and wishing that was there and, and not enjoying, like we lived right on the Chesapeake Bay, right? I wasn't enjoying that because I was thinking of so much about the mountains. So every place has its, its uh, advantages and, uh, you know, and disadvantages. Um, I think one of the tricks for us, us adventurers or people that enjoy getting out in the wild in the wilderness is how do you, how do you find a place where you can live, but you're also close to, you know, groceries and shopping and nice restaurants, right? So. And it's not always where you expect, you know, you, I love that you say that because that that's one of the big things on this show is, Hey, you don't have to be in Denver or in Seattle or you know, some big mountain town or little mountain town for that matter to, to be adventurous and to look at life that way. It really is like a perspective and everywhere, like you said, has something to offer that nowhere else does. And if you're willing to look for that and enjoy that, uh, anywhere is amazing. Re truly anywhere is amazing. It has just endless amounts. We're, we're going to have a guest on soon, a, a renowned adventurer that spent a year sticking to basically a 10 by 10 square mile grid for an entire year never left that grid and this guy's wow. been all over the world and he said there were things i never could have imagined that i discovered in the place i grew up that i thought i knew like the back of my hand there's so much it's never ending that's cool to hear so tell, tell us about your desire to hike the appalachian trail because you know coming from colorado and spending so long there it would seem like it would be maybe a western trail that would you know pique your interest first but what was it about the AT? Uh, the Appalachian Trail for me was kind of one of those things that was always on my list. I mean, I had heard about people hiking it. I thought it'd be really cool to do, but it was always a someday thing. I had a brother-in-law that tried it and did 100 miles before he gave up back when he was in college. And, and you know, so it was. we all have things that are on our list like that of whatever, maybe speaking another language or whatever that you want to do, but really, when are you going to find the time and have you know, fit it in amongst all the other things. And the Appalachian Trail, for most people, if they get you know, serious about it, they want to do what's known as a through hike, where you go from one end to the other. And most people, it takes them four or five months to do that. They've got to start as soon as it warms up a tiny bit in the spring, and you have to get up to Maine if you're going north before middle of October when they close the mountain. And so it was way, way, way down my list. And if I didn't have a incident from another adventure I was on, I, I would have never ended up hiking the Appalachian Trail. What happened was I had raced uh, motorcycles back when I was much younger in my teens and early 20s, um, had plenty of broken bones and injuries and things, as you can imagine, um, moved away from that, took it up again when I was 40. Um, went out on three rides. It was in the hospital That's a twice. great time. That's a great, a great time to pick up motorcycle racing yeah. again. <laughs> yeah. Was, you know, after being in the hospital two out of three rides, I said, hey, this is crazy. So, you know, sold the new bike, you know, brand new bike for sale. Take it away. Here's my boots. Here's my rent. You know, take the tires, take all my gear. Just go away. Go away fast. I didn't, I didn't want to, I didn't want to accept that I wasn't the younger version of me, right? And so... Was that Somehow, like a midlife crisis? Not a midlife crisis, but just, you know, trying to take another shot at it. And uh, because I, you know, I found that when you're, you know, when you're young, when you're 16, 17, 18, you go flying through the air and time slows down. You can see exactly what's happening and, and roll perfectly to just get up and you're a little sore the next day. Um, you know, I found as I started getting older with, uh, you know, things would happen. For example, in my 50s, I decided to take up riding again, despite my wife's warnings of don't do it, you're going to get hurt. Um, I promised her I wouldn't race. And then I ended up going into a hair scrambles race in New Jersey, which is a long story. I was trying to trick, pretend I wasn't going to race. And then people started passing me and I, the competitive spirit kicked in. And um, anyway, stuff when you're older, it just, you're riding along and then all of a sudden like what happened you know i i flipped the tree it was on the ground i'd shattered my hip dislocated my femur 
Um, they actually had to stop the race and reroute it around me, to carry me out of the woods, uh, put me on a four-wheeler in an ambulance for a short ride, put me in a helicopter, took me to Camden, New Jersey in the hospital. And um, unfortunately, when they were in the hospital, they crushed the nerve in my leg. They put my femur back into the shattered hip for some reason and crushed the nerve in my leg, which on a pain scale of one to 10, took it to about 200, which was quite the quite the experience. So uh, fast forward to- When, when almost, was that? When was that? That was in uh, 2000, March 3rd, 2013. That's, 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 Etched into your brain, huh? March third, oh, yeah. two thousand thirteen. So, so um, what were you feeling? On... Like, what was what was kind of the what what were you grappling with then? Like, oh my gosh, am I not going to be able to walk again? Like, what was going? You know, the most I mean? interesting part of that was that part, partly because of my background with you know it used to be when when uh, you know I'd break a leg or something that you know you put a cast on it and it's it's whatever in the cast for however long that, I forget how long it is, month or two or whatever. You know, they take it off, your leg's a little sore for the first six months, and then it bothers you if you walk on uneven ground for the year, but you, you get better, right? You heal. Um, in this case, with this nerve injury, it, it triggered this pain loop that oversensitized my central nervous system and, and created this situation where my brain just expected my foot and my calf to hurt, which is where the pain was, was just absolutely killing me. At one point I, I told my wife, I said, if I could just have one minute where my foot didn't hurt, that would be so, so wonderful. One, another time I called her and said, I've had it. I want to cut my leg off. She said, well, you know, take it easy. But the interesting thing was that because of my previous experience with injuries, I just kept expecting that I'd be, I'd be, I'd be healed in another three months, six months, I, you know, it's gotta be, it was always kind of around the corner when I hit six months, I thought, Oh, it'll just be another six months. But then after being on Oxycontin for 18 months, which is a whole nother, another story and finally getting off that I was coming up on two years. I'd seen, I think 23 doctors at the time was on all kinds of pain meds and things and just wasn't getting better. Just wasn't getting better. I wanted someone to fix it for me is what is looking back on it. I wanted someone to give me a pill someone to give me electronic gizmo, pull my leg, do something, just make, make all the pain go away. Right. That's what we want in life. We want, we want solutions. We want it for free. And yesterday, right. Just make the pain go away. And with, with chronic pain like that, one of the things that I, I had to learn and, and uh, part of that was this crazy idea I came up with. I actually saw the movie wild where Reese Witherspoon's character hikes the Pacific crest trail and uh, there's a place in that movie where she she drops one of her boots off the edge and she throws her other boot off the edge of the mountain. She's out in the wilderness with no boots to hike in. And that's that's kind of how I felt. I felt like I was off in this wilderness with no one that could help me. And But it piqued my interest enough. I read a couple of books about people hiking the Appalachian Trail and got this idea in my head that I was going to, I thought, you know, nothing else has worked. If I hike over 2,000 miles, that would have to fix my leg. And so I mentioned to my wife, who's like, yeah, that's really nice, dear. I mean, at the time, I could barely get out the door to walk my Yorkie. Um, and then I went to uh, REI and, you know, bought a pack and some poles and came back home and said, well, honey, I'm, I'm going to do it. And she's like, really, you're going to do it? So by yourself? I'm like, well, I haven't found anyone, but, you know, I'll figure that out. And yeah, three weeks later, I was on a train down to Georgia and did two and a half miles my first day and then went from there. Now, how long ago well, after you bought the pack and everything? Three weeks. <laughs> what kind of shape were you in? Horrible shape. I, was <laughs> I like, mean, I know the leg. I know I know all that outside um, of that. So I had never I had car camped with my kids before, but I'd never, you know, I'd never gone backpacking and. So I'm I'm watching all these YouTube videos and you know trying to figure out lightweight gear and how re, re uh, you know shipping boxes of food to yourself and all that stuff. I just I just was just I, I basically looked at it from the standpoint of I can live my life in this you know horrible chronic pain. I actually got suicidal at one point. Luckily, I got a good psychiatrist to help me with that. Yeah, but um, I basically could 
have this horrible life or I could hike the entire Appalachian Trail as much as choices. Jeez. <laughs> well, well, so, so, uh, um, two kinds of excruciating pains, you know what I mean? Yeah. So it's like, which so, one do you want? Which, which bill? Uh, can I, can I ask this? Like, were, were you this kind of person before this? Like, was this the way you went about decisions and raising kids and going through your career and just like choosing something and just going for it? Was that how you were? Yeah. Or do you feel like this was something new for you? No. Yeah. That's kind of my mindset. Um, uh, I'd actually, I had been doing triathlons and running marathons and I, I had fully trained for my third marathon. I was two weeks away, just peaking, just starting to taper down after doing all that I pre-run, you know, portions, the entire course. And so I got to sit in the hospital, look out the window on the day of the marathon. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I've always, I've always been inspired by, by a challenge. It's a weird, it's a weird thing, but um, I used to have this business partner who would say, oh, you know, if he wanted me to do something, he'd say, oh, you know, most people couldn't do this, but you know, Peter, if, if anyone could do it, you could, but I don't, I don't know. Most, most people certainly couldn't do this. I, I bet you can't do it. And I'd be like, oh yeah. And even when I figured out what he was doing, that would still work to motivate <laughs> me. And so there's something about, something about saying, hey, I'm going to go do this thing and, and having other people watching. Now I wasn't, I hadn't figured out uh, how to video blog or really all of that. I did, I did have a, a, a online blog I, I used uh, on trail journals when I was doing, doing the hike. Um, but you did but, know people, I mean, people knew you were out there. So there was at least that pressure of them knowing, yeah, hey, yeah. at some point and I'm I have to tell them I finished or I didn't. Right. Let's take a quick message break and hear from the folks that helped make this show possible. One thing you might not know about me is I can get down with some cowboy boots. On the weekends, I like to kind of explore my countryside a little bit. I grew up in the country near cattle farms and ranches, so I've spent my fair share of time around cowboy boots and appreciate high-quality boots. And that's why I'm a big fan of Tecovis. Tecovis is my favorite boot brand. They're bringing a fresh perspective to heritage boot making. They carry on time honored traditions and quality that you find in a great pair of cowboy boots, but they've innovated on comfort, style, and service. Their Western boots for men and women are handmade from the most premium leathers and over 200 time honored individual steps. And their service is unmatched. If you go into the store, you're greeted like family, offered a boot shine and a drink, and you can get custom fitted for a new pair of boots right there. You can find all their store locations at tecovis.com. And if you can't make it into the store, Tecovis delivers the most premium quality and most comfortable Western goods right to your door. Visit tecovis.com. That's T-E-C-O-V-A-S.com and point your toes west. That is plenty of that for now. Let's get back into the episode. Right. And uh, so that, I think that was a part of it. And, um, and just, I, I just had this belief that if I, once I made it to Maine, I would be fully healed. Now, you know, when you read the book, it, uh, it <laughs> you get to find out, uh, A, if I made it, so, you know, which I did, I'll, t I'll give you guys a s sneak peek on that. But, um, uh, it actually took me quite a bit longer than most people, and I had to figure out my own way to make it happen. But a lot of just crazy stuff happened along the way. Like one one night, fifteen medic medics came to rescue me at Deep Gap Shelter. What happened? Well, I, you know, when you start out hiking the Appalachian Trail, everyone everyone's kind of got this like, hey, "How are you doing? Great, you know yeah. what What are you doing? I'm going to Katahdin. I'm going all the way. I'm." And, and about three quarters of the people don't make it, which that's actually pretty good numbers as you compare it to other things that people start and don't finish. Yeah. But, but there's, a, there's almost like this overly exuberant, yes, I'm absolutely doing it to make up for the fact that you're scared to death. I, I mean, for me, I didn't know if I could make it the first mile or two. I, I hadn't walked on uneven surfaces and my, I couldn't move my lower leg for the entire first year I was injured. So all those muscles atrophied and the nerve connections weren't good. So my foot was like a floppy marionette foot. And so when I put it down on a rock, instead of the muscles, like slowly putting it down, it would just like bang 
bang down on the rock, which of course that's the foot that hurts like hell. So um, that didn't help. But um, you're crazy. What 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 were the people around you saying? I know your wife maybe has come to expect this from you. You know, I, I don't know. I feel like you know our, our spouses are often like, okay, you know, that's your latest crazy idea. I get it. Well, I've been around you. What what were other people saying? Or did you tell anybody? Well, people when I would when I would limp my way into a shelter at night, people <laughs> would look at me and go, "Oh my goodness, what, what are you okay? What happened?" They thought I, you know sprained my ankle or broke broke my leg or something said i was motorcycle and, racing and they're like what <laughs> well i used to i used to tell them the whole you know way too much information well let me tell you about it and 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 it was i was i was angry at other people when they would ask me about my injury now figure out why 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 is that someone else's fault it's my fault right yeah i was i was mad if someone would go running past me and i i would get, i would get ticked off that they're running cuz i i couldn't run anymore and and so a big part of the book uh is this whole process of going not just through the healing process but through emotionally through the acceptance of major changes in your life like this to where you can learn to make the most of them. I had, I had, uh, I had read a number of years ago that people who had a permanent permanent injury, someone maybe who's a, a quadriplegic is in a wheelchair. After a period of time, once they accept their position, they can actually be happier in life than other people who maybe haven't been injured, because part part of what my injury and my journey on the Appalachian Trail did for me is taught me to appreciate and accept the present moment in life and make the most of it rather than needing to be out there always look, looking for the next thrill or, you know, bungee jumping. I flew sailplanes for 10 years or, you know, race motorcycles. I mean, there's definitely a thrill-seeking part of me. And nowadays, I'm just, I'm so happy to go out for a five mile walk in the morning here in Florida. I mean, I still use my hiking poles because I'm a little clumsy on my left side, but so, so back to deep gap shelter. So I, I had this different things I was doing to convince myself that I can make it to Maine, right. When I was first in the first, you know, whatever month here. And so one of the things I did is when I was going up a long mountain, I would just tell myself, well, if I focus on my breathing and I just you know, take deep breaths and keep moving. If I can keep moving all the way to the top of the mountain, then that's, that means I can, I've got what it takes to make it to all the way to Maine was kind of this mental game I was playing. So I had been doing that that day and hadn't, hadn't figured out really hydrating properly. So I was, I was pretty dehydrated and worn out and anyways, got to this deep cap shelter and there's, you know, 15 or 20 people milling around and making their meals on the little stoves and talking and, started talking to this group of people on the side of the shelter and this, this, uh, Beth comes up and she says, uh, Hey guys, uh, uh, I've got some pot here. Anybody want to smoke some pot? And, and I'm thinking, well, gosh, I have, you know, haven't done that in 30 years or whatever since I was in high school, but what the heck I'm on the Appalachian trail. Why not? Oh right. My so gosh. it might help so, with the uh, pain. So, yeah, so it goes around and, uh, you know, I wanted to make sure that I, I got whatever effect. So I, let's just say I definitely inhaled like the three or four times. Around. <laughs> what I didn't realize is this was a whole different sort of a, a quality product that compared to the, whatever it was that I, I had um, partaken in back in high school. And, and uh, pretty soon I just, that I mean, things, things just, I started to get a little dizzy and things kind of started spinning a little bit. I thought, well, I need to, I'm going to go sit down. So I went and sat down on this, it was kind of a high bench on the side of the shelter. And I'm just looking out at the people in the trees and the sun filtering through. And next thing I know, I hear the shouting and, and there, I, I like lift my head up and I see these feet running over to me. I had passed out and fallen over and clunked off the, clunked my head on the ground. And I hear this guy yelling, he's had a seizure. He's had a seizure. He's had a seizure. And I'm thinking, what a seizure. I've, you know, had plenty of injuries. I've never had a seizure. That doesn't sound good. And, uh, he's like, I, I bet, I bet he's had a concussion. Um, ask, ask him what day it is. This, this, 
this gal bends over me. She says, what, what day is it? I, I said, what's today's date? I said, uh, March, March 20th. It, it was March 19th. She looked at me kind of funny. I go, no, no, March 19th. She goes, he doesn't know what day it is. This guy, which I gave him the name commander goes, he doesn't know what day it is. Stand him up. See if he can walk straight. Now I, I can't walk straight today, on a good day. 10 years later. <laughs> on, a, on your best day, you're not walking straight. <laughs> Back then, yeah, with my injured leg. So they yanked me up, like, you know, three or four people just like, whoa, yanked me up. And then I tried to walk <laughs> with no hiking poles or anything. And like, he can't walk. He's had a concussion. We're calling 911. So are you still just like out of it from, from, the, from the pot? Uh, yeah, a bit. Yeah, fair amount. <laughs> I was along for the ride. So um, so they call 911. They sit me down at, at, at the front of the shelter. And, and uh, there's there's all this chit- chitter. You know, there's a, a fire with people sitting around it talking yeah. and more hikers coming in. And and uh, oh, yeah, what's going on? Oh, yeah, he's uh, he's really bad. He had a he had a seizure. Oh, he's got a concussion. And, and oh, this other this other hiker they had to bring they had to fly them out i bet they're going to bring a helicopter in here because there was just a little goat trail three and a half miles down to the road from there and uh i'm starting to think oh my goodness i'm going to do another helicopter ride. <laughs> this, isn't, this isn't looking good this isn't going to go over well at home i thought i better reach out yeah. to joanna and and just give her a heads up so this is going to be worse than the original offense of the motorcycle crash. And, uh, I got high yeah. and it fell and it, down. And this was, this was after, you know, are, are, you're hiking alone on the Appalachian Trail. Is that safe? I'm like, what could possibly happen? I'll be fine. So so, um, so I'm like, any, has anyone got a I, – I can't get a signal on my phone. Anyone got something other than Verizon? I, I need to call my wife. Commander's like, I'll call her. What's the number? So I gave him the home number. He called that. No answer. I'm like, try, here, try, here's her cell number. I try this it's either it's either ends in 9925 or it's 9950 it's one of those two he's like he can't keep his number straight <laughs> i'd given him the right home number anyways so he calls her now at this point you got got to understand the dynamics of anyone who's been married could probably relate to this i knew my wife was going to hear the story i just didn't know if she was going to hear the whole story right so <laughs> So he he calls her and and says, uh, yeah, he's had a seizure, or he's got a concussion. Uh, they they're probably going to fly him out of here. And oh, what happened? Oh well, he was he was really dehydrated. He said, and there's another part of the story. I don't. I'll leave it up to him whether he wants to tell you about that other part of the story or not. But I I, I I'm not my place to tell you that. I'm just thinking like, okay, she's going to get the full story now. <laughs> so. Uh, yeah, my kids were freaked out. They were calling at the time, leaving me voicemails saying, oh, dad, I knew you'd be hurt and I'm so worried about you. And so uh, I sat there. I once, I once I started to feel better after a while and I said, hey, I'll get up and walk around and maybe see. he's like, you are not getting up. You are going to stay right there until you can be evaluated and then only then will you get up. And uh, I'm like, I'm just like, I was thinking like, Yes, sir. Number one. Number two, I was thinking, hey, if I ever actually write a book about this, this is definitely going in the yeah, book. Yeah, you're, you're getting thrown around. So, uh, the book. so yeah, 15 headlights popped out of the, the woods. Uh, it was dark at this point in time. They had come up some some side fire road or something with a, a Jeep and an ambulance and a bunch of ATVs and, and uh, uh, you know, evaluated me and looked in my eyes and had me walk around. He basically said it. I... I I think you're okay. He said, I, I, I usually get in trouble for taking people in too often. So, you know, there's no guarantees. I mean, you could have a heart attack or something and die anywhere, but yeah, I, I think you're okay. But if you want us to take you in, we'll carry you down. And I said, no, I think I'm okay. And then he said, Oh, by the way, we're hundred percent volunteer force. So no charge, which was great. to hear. <laughs> so then they take off. And then five minutes later, the commander goes up, he goes, he goes, where'd they go? I'm like, oh, they. He said it was okay, and they left. He goes, you refuse service. <laughs> I want to have you know, you are ruining our hike. So, so uh, anyways, I they made room for me in the shelter, and I in the morning it was foggy. I kind of tried to slip out and make my way down the mountain without getting any more attention. And for the next week, anyone I would see at a hostel or something, they're like, oh, you're Flash Fifty Two. Oh, I've heard all about you. <laughs> oh my God, was that your trail name? 
Yep. Flash 52. Flash because I, I was so slow, and then <laughs> I found out there was another Flash, so I added a, a racing number to the end of it. So That is hilarious. Yeah, that is so funny. That uh, So how mad was your wife? She was a little freaked out then. My kids were, yeah, my kids were real concerned. Um, my kids were laughing once they found out about the pot part. They thought it was real funny, so... Well, how, how how are you feeling, like, as far as the experience? That was like, okay, maybe some lessons learned there. Like, all right, maybe stay hydrated, take my time, don't don't indulge in anything too much. But So yeah. how are you feeling, like, okay, I'm going to keep going? Or were you having doubts at that point? Well, the problem was I was trying to do it as a through hike, right? I was trying to do it all in one year. And I had calculated I needed to do about 14 miles a day to do that with my, my zero or my non-hiking days. And um, I wasn't capable of doing that. Certainly at the time, I, you know, I was trying to do something I wasn't capable of. And so with my background and other things I've done in life, I have just found that if you just have the persistence and the determination, you can grit your way through anything. Well, I discovered you can't grit your way through 2,200 miles of hiking the Appalachian Trail. You can, you can go so far with, I mean, at one point, I, I ended up getting off all my pain meds and everything just because it was hurting so bad. I figured I'd just stop taking one of them every few days and still hurt like hell. So I thought, what the heck, I'll stop taking another one. And, I, you know, at one point I told myself, I said, I don't care if I, if I have to hike to mean on a bloody stump, I'm going to make it all the way. You, you can only push your body so far men- mentally, physically, and emotionally particularly when you're, you know, dealing with the physical exhaustion and the overwhelming pain, you can only go so far. So I ran myself into the ground in Irwin, Tennessee. It was a little over 300 miles. Um, ended up laying on the bed at a Motel 8 there for five days straight before I finally realized, hey, I, I got to go home. So I went home, rested up over the summer, figured out some new things, and ended up heading back out and going back down to where I had started before and headed out and uh yeah ended up going from tennessee all the way up to to maine um one one step at a time what was the big change between the two segments that you uh you you obviously did something different well one of the things i did was um during during that time off i i rediscovered walking in pools um with an injury like i had If you walk in a pool with the water up to your chest, you weigh about 20% of what you do normally. Mm -hmm. And so you can walk, um, instead of walking all cattywampus, which makes all your other muscles tighten up and just makes things hurt worse, you can kind of reset your your body to be correct and use all of the little muscles. Instead Instead of just stepping in the middle of my step, only just like on my weak side and then immediately over on my other side. I could in the pool step all the way through the, the foot and give all those muscles, not just the exercise of, of moving, but the but the uh, the blood flow and the the way to heal stuff is to give it give it very easy lots of very easy moderate movement. So what I did was I I went back out to the Appalachian Trail near where I lived in Maryland to just try out. I thought I'm going to go for two days and just see how it goes. So I parked my car hired someone to shuttle me down like 20 miles did, you know, two 10 mile days came back home for two weeks. Then I went back out and I'm like, Oh, I'll try three days. Then I was four days and then five days. And I thought, you know, this works out pretty good. Instead of getting to a, a trailhead at, you know, it's getting dark at night and sticking my thumb out, which I hadn't done in many, many years since I was 16, trying to get to town to resupply or whatever. If my car was there, I could get in the car, go drive to a nice Airbnb, go find a pool to walk in. I could go drive to the outfitters to get my gear fixed or a new pair of boots or whatever I needed. Emotionally, it turned it into, instead of thinking about, I've got 1,800 more miles to go or however far it is, I discovered that if I could just focus on getting to my car, I knew that I could go two more days to my car. Even even when I when I got up in Maine, I, there was a sign that says 500 miles to Katahdin. I thought, oh, okay, only 500 miles, only 500 miles. Later that week, 
I was thinking about only 500 miles and going up some mountain, climbing on my hands and, you know, my hands and feet like a monkey. There's places you just have to like Scream. make your way up, boulder up, up, up the stuff. I was thinking, I can't, I can't go another, whatever it was, 480 miles. I can't do that. I'm, I've got to quit. And then I thought, well, wait a minute. My car is only one day ahead. All I have to think about right now is to get to my car. So, so that's by what you breaking, did. yep. So by breaking the journey down into those little chunks and mentally just thinking about that, just that next little section. I mean, there were times when I would go to, you know, 10 or 12 days at a stretch, but for the most part, it was, you know, three, four, five day stretches. And if I could focus on that small little chunk and not think about the, the longer journey, I found mentally I was able to, I was able to do that. It's so like, you drive your car up and then get back to where you started and hike to it. Yeah, I paid a lot in shuttle fees, <laughs> <laughs> but I figured, uh, I figured, what the heck, uh, I'll, I'll find my way to make it work, and uh, and that worked. Yeah, yeah, it was you know it was there's just so many crazy like this one uh, there's this one hostel, right after you get out of the Smoky Mountains, uh, it was supposed to rain that night, and I I you know was. Tr- trying to move along i'm moving slower than everyone else but i finally get there i'm like oh great have you got a spot for me yep hey yep yeah i got a queen bed cost you 20 bucks 20 bucks for one one, one side of the bed I, I said okay uh that's great uh uh i'll take it and uh, uh i said that now the other side of the bed uh I'll, how about i'll give you another i'll give you another 20 bucks for that so i can have the whole bed he's like nope Got to keep it open in case we can have another hiker that comes along. <laughs> Anybody show up? No, I had it. I had it on my own. That is funny. That's uh, that sounds about right. That sounds about like the folks up there. So um, yeah, I couldn't believe just all the different. I mean, I I I didn't m- meet a guy. His trail name was Doctor Fix It. I hiked with him for about a month and a half up through Pennsylvania and into New York, and he was an absolute riot. Was just he's doing all kinds of stuff to. I mean, he told me these stories and things. I I could not figure out what was fact, what was fiction. He I I said he was either he was either a insane or a ge- genius. I couldn't figure out which one. The, the line is um, thin. What? So when did you think you had a book on your hands? Did it become pretty apparent, or did it get take some time once you finished to say there are some wild and awesome stories in here? Well. Um, I think once I was, I think once I was into the hike and once I restarted, I, I knew, I knew that I would probably write a book and my goal with the book was to, was to inspire and encourage other people. Uh, and that's one, that's one of the things that's been interesting about the book. I mean, it appeals to hikers, anyone interested in the Appalachian trail, but, um, I've got over 1400 reviews on Amazon right now where people are like, Hey, this, you know, some of them are like this saved my life, changed my life. Some people who were, you know, weren't thinking of living much longer. And they just said, Hey, I just picked up your book every time I was feeling down. Um, but a lot of, a lot of people are like, I don't think I'd ever want to hike the Appalachian trail, but after reading your book, I know I could accomplish anything. So it, it, it achieved its goal of being kind of inspiring and motivational, but, um, I have a, a special place in my heart for anybody who's struggling with chronic pain, um, um, coming back from injuries, in fact, if you, if you know of anyone or anyone sees this podcast and wants a free copy of the book that's struggling with chronic pain, just um, if they reach out to me, I'd be happy to send them a free copy. So that's that's part of my mission with the book is to, uh, if I can create, I found that we can deal with any type of struggle as long as we have hope. If you lose hope, you're, you're sunk. So if you, if you can have hope for a better future, yes, it's going to hurt today, but if you've got hope and, and uh, expectation that you, you can get better or find ways to deal with it. And that's, that's one of the things I, I had to learn with chronic pain was um, I'd mentioned earlier how I, I, in the beginning, I wanted someone to just fix it for me. So I had, I had to do a couple of things. Number one, I had to accept full responsibility myself rather than expecting some doctor or someone else to fix it for me. Number two, I had to recognize that, that, overcoming a huge challenge like that of having terrible pain from an injury was it, it was going to have to be done with tiny little baby steps. So I learned if I could do one or two little things 
that would reduce the pain by just a, a you know one one or two percent. If you can find ten of those things, then it reduces it by ten ten or fifteen percent. Right? Simple little things like not holding your breath. Right? In the beginning, when you're in pain, you're just like ah, that like hurts. It hurts. It hurts. It hurts. You're just so tight and so focused and and just taking a breath and being like, hey, do what you can. Right? Relax. Um, and, uh, yeah, and that it's going to be a journey. It's going to be a journey, um, to the, the brain is, is really kind of crazy the way it works where, like I mentioned, it gets into this pain loop and to break that pain loop, you've got to stop fighting it and, and get to a place where you can accept it and be okay with the signals that your body is, is sending between your brain and the, the rest of your body. And then, um, I even came up with like, uh, affirmations that I could listen to while I was hiking. Like, it's, it's okay. It's all right. You're, you know, you're stepping down and it's, it's safe. <laughs> what kind of adaptations, uh, the, the car strategy is great because that breaks it down. And I think a lot of us need some that when tackling, you know, insurmountable or what seems like impossible journeys, like 2000 miles is a lot to think about, but if I can get three days of the car, I can do that. Um, what other things did you have to make adjustments for, or that you had to consider that maybe, maybe other through hikers didn't, or the, those that you were talking to around you weren't even thinking about? Well, I, um, I got pretty focused on traveling light in the beginning. I thought to travel light that you had super lightweight versions of everything. One of the things I did, which is, is true, light, you know, lighter weight, I ended up rebuying a pack and sleeping bag and pad and a bunch of stuff that I originally bought that wasn't as light as I could get. Uh, tent, you know, I jumped in with a $600 tent that was wonderful. What I discovered, though, is that the easiest way to be lighter is just not to carry something. So there's all kinds of things that, like in the beginning, I had a, a mini iPad because I weighed a iPad, it weighed like less than just one paperback book. And I thought, well, I'll just have the mini iPad to read my books on. I discovered two things. One, at night, I'm so tired, I can't read more than about a paragraph or two before I fall asleep anyways. Number two, I could just get the Kindle app on my phone and just read read books on my phone. Um, so no iPad, you get rid of that. There's There's just all kinds of stuff. Now, I probably cut corners a little more than most people would, like... Uh, Medical kit, I just dwindled that down to where I think that got down to maybe some duct tape and I don't know, some of that uh, that stretch tape that you can put around um, sore toes and blisters and stuff like that. Um, but uh, the nice thing about the Appalachian Trail anyways is is particularly further south, there's so many people hiking along that in many cases, if you, if you really were hurt or something happened, someone's going to come along and they can either call and get help, get you what you need, or they might even have, they might be carrying what you need. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, by the time I got up into the Northern States, I, I got rid of my stove. I didn't, it just, it, the less, the less you carry, it's not only the less weight you have, but the less things you have to keep track of and re, you know, get a new canister when the gas runs out and deal with that and planning and where you put it in your pack and all that stuff. Just less is less is more. Um, so that, and then I got very good at slack packing, which is uh, uh, finding a way to where you don't have to carry all your stuff with you. So if you can, for example, in um, Pennsylvania, which we hikers call Rocksylvania on the Appalachian Trail because there's so many rocks there. I didn't know if I could make it through there with the way my foot was. Um, and so we found a hostel that had really good shuttle rates and they were just super friendly and they, they shuttled. This was when I was hiking with Dr. Fix it. They shuttled us for a good, good part of Pennsylvania where they take us out, drop us off. Actually, actually we would take my car up, drop, drop our car off at the end of where we we're going to hike that day. They, they'd um, shuttle us back down to where we we're starting. And so we would hike with just like a little, day pack or our, a regular pack with hardly anything in it. We'd have a, maybe a raincoat and our lunch and, you know, stuff for water, water to filter or whatever, instead of carrying 20 or 25 pounds, you might have, you know, six or seven pounds. So you'd slack pack and be lighter weight to go over some of these rockier sections and things. So, yeah. 
Yeah, and the nice th nice thing with the car is I could trade my equipment in and out if if uh, uh, if it was going to be colder for a week, I could switch to my heavier. You know, uh, I think it was a fifteen degree bag was my heavier bag I had instead of my thirty degree summer bag, for example. Let's take a quick message break and hear from the folks that help make this show possible. That is plenty of that for now. Let's get back into the episode. Once you got close to the end, take take us through that sensation. Like this has been a dream for so long. You know, the the finishing is always different for everybody. But what what was going through your mind as you as you approached that and it started to come well, come into sight? I had about two weeks left to go, and I called my wife and just said, "I'm so tired of this. Uh, I've seen about all I want to see. It's not going to be any different." I think I'm going to come home. <laughs> she said, are you crazy? You put all this effort in. You've been out. You've hiked almost 11 months over a year and a half. You, you better stick with it. I think you're going to regret if you don't finish it. So luckily, I listened to her advice. Um, yeah, towards towards the end of a long journey like that is, is uh, I mean, you're trying to enjoy enjoy it still, but there's definitely just a like, I just want to get this done and mark it off. Now, I, st I still figured that I would be healed by the time I got up to the top of Katahdin, even, even though I was limping my way along. You know, and what was healed that. to you? Healed was pain-free? Pain, well, that's a good question. I guess at that point in time, it was, it was uh, pain-free and able to, able to run again, maybe, or, you know, I was able to walk. I, I mean, if a bus was going to hit me, I could probably get out of the way. But, I, you know, I very clumsy on that side. So, um, so yeah, made it up, made it up Katahdin, and um, coming down, and happened to mention to this guy that I just completed the Appalachian Trail. He's like, "Oh, congratulations!" Uh, and he says, "And to think you did it with a bum leg." He said, "Because <laughs> I'm limping along." You know? And I thought, okay, well, maybe I'm not. Uh, maybe it's not going to be like this magical moment. Now you had asked about writing the book and the the timeline, and that affected it because I had all these stories. Um, certainly, a lot of editing and moving and figuring out flashbacks to you know my story of of a uh, why how, why how in the heck could anyone get suicidal and how I dealt with that or how I got off, off opioids or um, a lot of stuff I tie into things that happened earlier in my life. That, that helped make the story funny or whatever. Um, but I realized after a number of years, people kept saying, hey, when's your, how's your book coming along? When are you going to complete that? I was waiting to be 100% healed so that the book, originally I thought, you know, well, when I get to Maine, I'm 100% healed. That makes like such a wonderful story, right? It's like this fairy tale ending. I make it, I'm there, I'm healed on the top of the mountain, right? And uh I realized that I was waiting for an alternative ending of, well, I wasn't healed then, but two years later, I managed to be fully healed by doing what I was doing, which at that point in time, you know, walking in pools and riding my bike and walking, many of the things I continue doing today. And so it was on my seven year anniversary, March 3rd is an important date to me, the date I was injured. And it's always a big day. I actually went back down to McAfee Knob. McAfee, it's McAfee or McAfee. I think it's McAfee. Um, I've been told I pronounced that wrong. And actually, I've, it's Appalachian Trail, not Appalachian Trail. I'm told. So, so uh, yeah, I went up and hiked back up there. Got some photos. Actually, got this photo on the the front of the book um, that day because when I had hiked it before, when I went through, it was kind of cloudy and didn't get good photos. But um, I realized that night that, you know, I spent the night out there in a shelter, I realized, you know, this, this is going to be ongoing for my life. I'm going to continue to do what I can do. As I mentioned earlier, luckily I'm no longer in pain, but I, you know, I, I work at it. I, I, um, I've only done three miles so far today, but most days I walk five miles, um, just out around here in the beautiful Florida countryside in my neighborhood. But, um, recognizing that, that I wasn't going to have that fairy tale ending. I had to come up with a different way to explain the ending of the book, which uh, 
when when uh, if you're watching this, if you if you get a chance to read the book, I'll I'll leave that for you to find out what what happened. But yeah, did you come across anybody else that was also doing it in a unique way like you were? You know, we there's so many stories that come from the AT of folks doing it despite something or, or doing it with some sort of adjustment. Like I saw one yeah. guy because I've been on it. I've been backpacking on the AT, and you you come across through hikers. I saw one guy one time. He was for some strange reason carrying instead of hiking poles rebar in each hand, and so it was literally 15 pounds of rebar per hand. And he had been carrying it from Maine, and we were we were in Southern North Carolina. Yeah, and I thought, I mean, his arms. I mean, he, he uh, just you know, you come across anybody else that was like you, you connected with in that sense. Yeah, I mean, you meet all types of people. Um, I met the guy. His trail name was Optimistic Dreamer uh, in Virginia. He was going southbound. Was he super pessimistic, <laughs> kind of like you with Wash. Well, he hadn't had the best life his uh his mom had died and a brother and then his son died and he said he was either going to oh, kill himself man. or he was going to hike the Appalachian Trail and his story was he started three days later his gear looked like he'd gotten it at Goodwill and um he's the only guy I saw that carried a full size pillow with him <laughs> and uh he's like you know I just came and I haven't had to spend any money you know God provides it's been crazy people just give give me stuff and uh a little later, he was giving me this whole spiel about how he thought how unfair it was that they charge you 20 bucks for a permit fee in the Smoky Mountains. And I, I was about to reach in and give him a $10 bill. And I thought, oh, wait a minute, he might be working me over here. So then this other couple showed up. He went down and talked to them for 15 or 20 minutes. He comes back. He's like, hey, look, look what they gave me, Mountain House meal. <laughs> so you just and then I, I actually ended up meeting him back up in Maine. He, he went all the way down to Georgia, kept going to Florida, did the Florida trail that winter and then started hiking north again the following year. And I met him in Maine. Uh, when he when he was getting out of a car with a broken ankle, he had fallen off a mountain part of the trail or whatever and broke his ankle. Anyways, there's just, there's, there's, you know, people with sticks and big teddy bears. And um, one guy was hiking with, with uh, the dog tags of 44 different veterans that he he told me that um, at that time there were twenty was twenty one or twenty two veterans that were were um, dying by suicide a day. I think and that's that still was, true, unfortunately. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So he was hiking to to help with that and honor those people who served for our country. Um, and there and there's people you know you meet you meet people just you go out and you sit around the campfire at night and you talk to, there was this time there's like these three engineers that were out for a three or four day hike. And they, once a year, they go out and go on a, you know, go for a couple of days or a week or however long, just for a time out together. Um, and that's, that's the times I really enjoyed. We're, you know, sitting around, sitting around the campfire and, uh, if, if anyone's read any of the books about the Appalachian Trail, they talk about this, the support and camaraderie and just everyone's kind of going in the same direction. And for the most part, people are very, very supportive and helpful. I certainly struggled with being slow and, you know, someone would come hiking by. I'm like, hey, how you doing? You know, you want to hike with me? I didn't say this, but I'm kind of thinking you, you want to hike with me for five or 10 minutes or half a day. And within some of them would just go marching up. <laughs> See you up the trail. See you later. <laughs> See yeah. you later. So you were still in pain at the end. What had changed about that situation? Well, there was there was uh, may, maybe you could design a better plan, but mentally to have be put in a situation where, from a physical rehabilitation standpoint, against this idea of making a challenge and putting yourself in a situation where you don't have any choice. Before I went hiking, I was sitting there on the couch watching Netflix, trying not to think about how much my foot and leg was hurting. Once, once I was out on the trail, I'd wake up, my leg is stiff. It would hurt like crazy. I mean, just to like take the first few steps and try to just loosen it up was, you wouldn't even think I could walk on it, but I knew that over time it would loosen up and maybe the first hour would hurt. And then in the middle of the day would start to feel okay. And then the end of the day would start to get sore and tired again, but having, 
my goal, the way I broke it down was if I could do 10 to 12 miles a day, that was good for me. I, I, um, at one point I was listening to, uh, Tim Ferriss podcast and he said, Hey, if you're doing a big challenge or something, come up with a way to make it fun and easy. What, what could you do to make this fun and easy? And I thought, instead of worrying about trying to do longer miles, if I can do, if I can do 11 miles a day, that's all I'm going to worry about. If I can do, if I feel good, I can go further. Great. But I'm just going to shoot for 10 or 11. And, um, it was great physical therapy. I didn't have choice. I didn't have to decide, oh, should I go to work out today? Should I go out for a walk? Should I stay here and watch Netflix? It was, I didn't have that, that mental gyrations going on. I had, okay, I've, I'm going to get up. I know which direction I'm going to go. I'm going to go North. I know I need to do about 10 miles. Um, I didn't travel real fast. It took me about a mile an hour, including my stops and stuff. So I knew if I was going to go 12 miles, it was going to take me 12 hours. So if it was seven in the morning when I started hiking, I knew by seven at night, if I could just keep moving along, I would have my 12 miles in. And, and, um, after, after coming home, um, I still, still was in pain and, um, tried a few different things. I think I went on, there's different, there's different like nerve, nerve blocking drugs and thing, gabapentin and Lyrica and things like that, that all these things have side effects. And I've met an awful lot of people who are kind of like me who finally figure out that the drugs aren't going to do it for you. You just got to find a way to may maybe use something that's not an opioid to help manage it. But ultimately it's up to you to, if you can keep moving. And for me, it meant walking in pools was a big thing. Um, riding a bike is good. It keeps things loosened up. Nerve, nerve pain. If you just sit still, it gets worse and tightens up. If you can do gentle, lots of gentle, easy movement, it, it makes it better. And so it wasn't until after I was done hiking that I met with a doctor who I've been to a number of them that they wanted to do a spinal cord stimulator, which is a thing that goes in your back and it puts some electrical signals. And most of the research I've done on that is people might use that if they're in terrible pain, but generally most of them aren't still using it within a year. The lead, the leads move and they have to redo it and resurgery and it's, it's not, it's not, uh, it's not like something that's going to fix you. And, um, uh, so I, I was going to see a doctor for one of those and, and she was saying, Oh, we'll give you a spinal cord stimulator. I'm like, I'm not so sure about that. And she looked at my foot and she goes, she goes, Oh, that's, that's it. I don't know why not. That's classic CRPS. I'm like, what did you say? She's like, oh, that's classic CRPS. I'm like, what, what is that? What does that mean? She said, oh, it's complex regional pain syndrome. I'm like, right. <laughs> Get home, Google it. You know, I found out there's, there's all kinds of people and best, you know, everyone's a little different, but that's the, the best definition of, of this pain loop thing that, that I've uh, referenced earlier that many, many people suffer this. Some people with just a minor injury or sprain, we don't know why, but, but the brain can, instead of the, the symptoms of, of CRPS are basically something instead of healing up and getting better gets hurts, hurts more and more over time, or just doesn't get better. And, uh, it's, uh, it, it's something a lot of people, a lot of people suffer with. So I, from my standpoint, being able to hike the Appalachian trail and to, to kind of force myself is the right right term to use but to to keep moving and and work at getting my mobility back and my strength back and using my body even though it was injured even though it hurt was the very best thing that I could do I've I've met people who who have CRPS that I met a guy who hadn't moved his arm in 10 years and had it in a sling and he was he was freaking out because the door was open a crack he was saying is that a breeze coming in oh my goodness it's hurt my arm it's hurt my arm it just, um, we're, we're made to, to walk, we're made to move and our body is, is extremely, um, capable of coming back. But some of those things are going to be a very, very long journey. I, I like to watch videos of, uh, um, different people that have had major injuries or traumatic brain injuries or things like that. And the, the whole process of having to learn to come back. Many of them, you know, have to learn how to speak again or walk again or whatever. And the funny thing about it is, is I'm just as happy nowadays 
going for a hike out in my neighborhood with my hiking poles on a flat ground here in Florida as I as I was, you know, years ago when I'm mountain biking in the the mountains of Colorado, I'm coming down scary peaks and getting all scraped up at times. <laughs> I think that's part of maturing. Um, well, maybe maturing or getting older or whatever. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. We'll call it maturing. Uh, no, it's, it's, I think it's part of just realizing that, you know, everything you need and everything your soul, your body needs is, is right here. And you can, yep. you don't need to be, you know, 2000 miles away to, experience adventure and to to tap into those things that make you happy it's right out your door it's it's outside wherever that is and what do you think is one of the lasting lessons for you after this experience like what what do you think's most different about you now that you've done this that you just couldn't have you just couldn't replicate if you hadn't done it uh the biggest the biggest difference is i'm I'm uh, I'm content. I'm I'm just fully accepting of life. Not not only my current situation in life, but just all all the other things around me. If I'm you know if I'm around somebody else, a, you know a family member or maybe my wife or something. If they you know if they each person has their own things that make them who they are. Right, that their characteristics, which we can look at some of those things and we can get irritated and say, why are they always like that? Or we can look at it and say, well, that's, that's who they are and that's how they operate. And isn't that neat that they, they, you know, they're that way. My wife's very passionate about some of the stuff she, she does. She's, she's got a business where she um, helps patients and addiction treatment centers around the country um, recover better by tracking their progress. And she, she works, seven days a week at that. And, and I, you know, I used to be where that would bother me and like, gosh, why can't she, you know, have more time for, for me or whatever. And uh, now I just think it's so cool that she's, she's passionate about what she does. And, and uh, isn't that neat that she wants to change the world and how lucky I am to be around someone like that. So it's, it's, it's all kind of how you look, look at things in life, but um, overall, biggest change for me is just uh i went from someone who who was always kind of looking for the next thing or looking for a way to to find fulfillment in life to realizing that i've got i've got everything i mean that's that's one of the things with hiking the appalachian trail right you have everything you need right on your back and you just realize that life is good and you can walk along and look at the ferns and listen to the woodpeckers and hear the owls hooting at night and all of that. Um, and that's, that's ultimately right. What, what a, most people, anything they're doing, it's just to find more happiness and contentment. So if you can find a way to get that where you, you have that already. And then anything that happens to you in life is just a bonus on top of that. Then how good is that? You still get mad at runners? Nope. <laughs> no, nope. no, that's, that's beautiful beautifully said. And, uh, is there anywhere in particular you want to point people to, to get the book? And, and also let me ask this only when I step on it, it sounds like a response to a question. Is that just something you said a thousand times out there? Yeah. Yeah. It only hurts. Only hurts only when I step on it. <laughs> um, yeah. And that's kind of the mindset too, right. Of Not, you know, well, gosh, only, only when I step on it. Um, yeah, it's on Amazon. It's on Audible. I did record the Audible version myself. So a lot of people who prefer to listen to it can get it on Audible. Um, there is, uh, I think if you go to adversitypress.com, there's, let's see, actually, I, I told one of my readers the other day that, that uh, um, he was wanting to see photos. So I, I, I've got a video that my kids made me up on that site. Um, but I, I will get that site updated with some other links and, and, uh, some more photos and stuff like that. There are color photos in the Kindle version that I added based upon comments from my readers. Um, the paperback, it's too expensive to print it, I think with color photos. So, um, but you should be proud. 1500 people have left reviews on Amazon. That is no small feat. And 
uh, they are overwhelmingly five star and excited about what you've done and have have been inspired by it. So, and what's cool for for just listening to your story is, you know, I know I'm not dealing with necessarily chronic pain. Well, you know, there's my knees hurt, my toes sure. hurt this morning from paddle boarding yesterday. I'm like, what? oh goodness, just that, just getting older and. But what these stories do for those of us who might, might not be dealing with the exact same thing you are, it's just like, wow, so that can often be a fear out on the horizon. What if I can't do this one day? Or what if something changes about my capabilities? And it's people like you that are like, uh, they give us hope, give me hope that no matter what, no matter what my body's capable of doing in the future or what changes might just happen in whatever circumstance, you, you can find a way to still enjoy this life and still uh, do adventures, not just anything. I mean, you did the whole Appalachian Trail. How amazing is that? That's that's I, I've never done that. Most of the people listening have never done that. It just gives a lot of hope that whatever comes, you can make the most of it. And that's yep. what's uh, – it might not even be the thing that, that, that – I might be tapping back into this conversation years down the road when something does happen, you know? but you're planting the seeds now. So keep doing what you're doing. And let me ask you this, AT, check, a lot of adventures. I don't mean to put pressure on adventures because they're often asked what's next, but is there anything else on the horizon that you just, you know, I'd love to do that. Or are you really, I'm happy doing my five miles a day and, and living my well, life. Well, yeah, I'm thrilled doing my five miles a day. Um, my grandkids, as they grow older, I will take them out for some shorter, we might do a week or something. Part of the story, as you read the book, you'll discover that I used up all of my credits with my wife. <laughs> At one point, I flew flew out to Colorado for my daughter's wedding and flew back on the same plane with my wife um, into Baltimore. And I was connecting, grabbing a flight to go up back up to New York to get back on the trail. And my wife, who's an incredibly strong woman, um, in the 30 plus years that I've known her. I've seen her cry like three or four times. She starts bawling at the airport and just crying, saying, I just, it's so hard without you. I don't want you to go hiking. Please don't go. Please don't go hiking. Please come, please stay home with me. Don't go, don't get on your flight. And I, I explain in the book, how I'm, I hate to admit this, but I just said, honey, I've got to do this. I hope you'll understand. And I just put my head down and walked away to get on my flight and left her there crying oh and, and just, <laughs> so <laughs> she's, she's an angel for supporting me. I mean, we've supported each other with many, many different things at different times, um, over the years, but it was, you know, it was really hard on her and we've had conversations about it and, and, uh, a long, a long hike. I, I don't know. It, it, you know, I mean, I could say, oh, well, you know, if I wasn't married, maybe I would go do a longer hike, but I, I just had such a great time and such a wonderful adventure and just feel so content with life right now. If you, if you really think about that, it's, it's, that's a very different place to be as opposed to, Oh, I got this done. What, what can I go out and do next? Like uh, not, not that that's a bad thing, but, but for me, it used to be that next thing was looking for that way for a, a new thrill or a new challenge or a new something because I, because I didn't have what I felt like I needed to have at that point in my life. My, my life was missing something right now. Life is great to be able to get on here and talk about only when I step on it. And, you know, if someone, I know that someone listening to this, if they can just enjoy it as a great beach read, they're going to get a lot out of it. Um, my hope is that through us talking here today, somebody out there who is struggling with chronic pain or coming back with a big injury or just really having a tough time in life, if they can go through and even just by reading some of the funny stories in there, get lighten their load a little bit or hopefully find it inspiring so that they can they can stay after it. Because life can be tough at times. It can be very challenging at times. And uh, whatever I can do to, to help someone along the way on their journey, it's kind of a fun thing that came out of my healing adventure on the Appalachian Trail. Mm, that is awesome. 
Gosh, well, Peter, we'll point people to the book. We'll probably do a giveaway too. Honestly, I, I'll probably ask listeners if you want if you want to check it out. Uh, we'll we'll do yeah. a, a book let giveaway. Let me or two. let we'll, me know. We'll we're happy. That. You know, we'll we'll, buy uh, well that. we're happy to support that. Let us know. We're happy to ship you out whatever you need. Yeah, or just you you can track it and just let us know. We can ship it directly to them. Yeah, awesome. Yeah. You know. Thanks so much. Okay. Thanks, Thanks, Mason. All right. Yep. Talk soon. Take care. Right. Bye bye. First of all, thank you so much for listening. It means the world to us that you choose to listen to the show. If you'd like to help us further, you can leave a review on iTunes, share us with your friends, your family. It goes a long way to grow in the show. You can also support us financially through patreon.com slash adventure sports podcast. Link is in the show notes. And also, if you have an idea of who could be a good guest for the show, we're always looking for people to tell their story uh, about the outdoors or adventure. So if you know someone, please reach out. Email us at info at adventuresportspodcast.com. And until then, get out there and have some fun.